Hi, welcome to Inside City Council. Today our guest, Councilman Curtis Jones. Thank you for joining us, Councilman. Thank you for having me. Talk to us about, this has been a big part of your activity since joining Council, public safety, uh, head of the, the committee. Talk to us about why that's important to you. Well, public safety means different things to different people. Public safety to the lady coming home at night on the SEPTA platform um, and is attacked by a stranger means something different to the expectation of the child when she's delivered to the public school um, and the expectation of the police officer that goes on a shift or the young urban male that gets stopped at 2 in the morning by the police officer. So public safety is not one size fits all. And what we've tried to do in city council is make sure all of Philadelphians are looked after in different capacities. Um, I did not want, to be honest with you, public safety. Uh, the, uh, former Councilwoman Donna Reed Miller uh, chaired it, but she went on and uh, retired. And it's just unnatural sometimes for an urban male to want to be uh, around the police, prisons, courts, fire departments, things like that. But uh, because of the serious nature of it impacting so many of my constituents, um, I took on uh, the responsibility at the request of the president of the city council. So we jumped into it head first. Ban the box was one of our issues where uh, we made it uh, illegal for an uh, employer to put on uh, an application, have you been convicted? Uh, we took on... Can I stop you there for a mm -hmm. second? Just because that's something that a lot of people I don't think would necessarily would fall under the umbrella mm -hmm. of public safety. Mm -hmm. Yet it can quite, it, it, it definitely is for those people who that box effect, yeah. affects. People re-enter at the rate of 500 a week from incarceration mm -hmm. to Philadelphia. Um, and those people don't, they're not from another planet. They're from our neighborhoods. And the idea is to get them to a point where they are self-sufficient and where they are productive members of our society as opposed to the defendant, please rise. So there is a link to public Absolutely. safety because of reentry and uh, reincarceration rates uh, that Philadelphia has experienced. So we took on that issue. Um, we've took on, taken on the issue on the other side of it, uh, public safety cameras. Uh, to protect individuals to be a force multiplier for the existing police force. Because it's, it's real easy to say we need 500 more police officers to take on the almost national groundbreaking one murder a day that this uh, uh, city experiences, or you can use technology uh, in a way that is creative and actually aids uh, the police officer at the street level to um, keep us safe. On that same note, you've also uh, tried to deal with gun violence. Talk about some of the measures that you guys have taken on that. Well, uh, long before I got here, Councilwoman Miller and Council President Clark introduced gun legislation to uh, ban weapons uh, and certain types of uh, uh, purchases in the city of Philadelphia. So much so that the NRA, National NRA, came here and uh, uh, filed a lawsuit. Uh, the legislature, our allies in Harrisburg actually prohibit us from introducing more uh, gun legislation that they believe supersedes their authority at the state. So it started there. Um, we've looked at uh, the fact that um, guns and bail, there's a correlation there, that sometimes our courts have not done enough to recognize that if an individual on Monday takes a gun and says to you, I'm dangerous, you let them out on Tuesday, and then on Wednesday, they try to convince you again uh, that they are dangerous and have a gun, that by Thursday you should believe them, and that stiffer bail should be a part of it. Talk to us about gun stat. What we've looked at is how crimes happen. Um, and the di district attorney, along with the mayor, started to use evidence-based statistics about where crimes happen, and then to map and triangulate who's doing it. And so if you have a corner like in my district, 24th and Lehigh, uh, where every Friday through Saturday somebody's going to get robbed, then we start to pay attention to that corner and the actors. And they created a task force, multi-jurisdictional, federal, city, uh, state, law enforcement, but not just law enforcement. The people that are looking at um, child support cases, tickets, and saying that these individuals have been identified as people of interest that are committing, 5% uh, of the population committing 
90% of the crimes. And so the, we're going to make sure that we pay particular attention. So when um, JoJo uh, comes in for his regular uh, routine roundup and he's accused of something, he doesn't get the assistant to the assistant district attorney. He gets the number two gun. Mm -hmm. And we pay attention. And we don't try to railroad him, but we're going to give you the best we have because you're giving us the worst you have. And so that has begun to work. If you look at this time last year, um, murders are down. Now, we have the summer to get through, but the crime stat theory is to take down that entire corner and give the right hand of fellowship to those who come next. Now, you don't have to follow their example. Here are programs for employment. Here are things that you can do to make yourself a part of society as opposed to um, uh, a, a resident uh, up at the state. Obviously, what's going on in the country right now, the climate is really there for, at least from public sentiment, to make some changes around gun legislation and gun law. Uh, when you look at what's happening in the city of Philadelphia, and what you mentioned before about the state kind of stepping in and superseding uh, what you tried to attempt, do you think there's new space to operate and to, and to maneuver into doing some new things around gun legislation? Well, when Sandy Hook happened, it changed the dynamic because it's not just an urban problem. It's not just those people. It's everywhere and it's anybody. These bullets don't know what income you have, what race you are. They will hit you and end you uh, without prejudice. Um, so when the uh, less affected are as incensed as the most affected, change tends to happen. And so we believe that the timing is right for some gun legislation. Um, and no, we're not going to get everything we want, uh, but we might limit the number of, of guns sold in one month. Who needs 30 guns in one month? I mean, what are you building up for? Or if a, gu a gun is stolen, you have to report it. These are common sense measures. If indeed you have a uh, protection against abuse order, maybe we should let you have a cooling off period and not sell you a firearm. Now, these seem like common sense things to uh, most people, most rational people, but there are those extremists who believe that you're infringing upon their constitutional right to bear arms. Well, it's ridiculous. Um, and, and if you look at what's happening to us, we are statistically safer uh, in uh, Afghanistan than in walking the streets of the city of Philadelphia. Life is precious even in urban Philadelphia. And so those people who would defend their constitutional rights don't walk the streets at night of Philadelphia. Do you have a concern that the life, the value of a life, isn't considered the same um, from other parts of the country as it would be necessarily in the city of Philadelphia? It's not just other parts of the country, Al. It's in our own neighborhood. There's a senseless nature of desensitization of our young people. Teddy bear memorials aren't things they should see, uh, 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 memorializing someone in their neighborhood. I remember as a freshman, um, I keep these because these were left over from a uh, crime scene. The police officers couldn't find all of the shells that were there. And there was a memorial placed at the scene days later. But kids were playing rope within that week, right near the memorial. So. I watched a Clint Eastwood movie where the end of the entire movie, there were seven murders. That's just a bad weekend in Philadelphia in some parts of our town. So we have to, it's not just what uh, people in Oklahoma feel or Utah feel, it's what we have to be incensed with about what's going on in our neighborhood. And so it's not for just law enforcement, it's letting young people know that life is precious and that conflict resolution shouldn't happen at the end of a gun and that he is, she is your brother's keeper, and you should consider their life precious. And, and, and um, we have to do a better job of civility and teaching citizenship in our schools. And so it's not just the NRA's problem, it's our at the dinner table problem, and we need to address it. What would you say to those who say that government can't fix these kinds of problems, that it's up to uh, charitable organizations, churches, community organizations to get on top of this, and that government really can't touch on these issues effectively? I would say in part they are right, but it's a partnership. 
that we play our role. We cannot mandate, legislate what happens at your dinner table. And whether or not you go up to your child's uh, school when there is a confrontation. And when you go there, are you responsible enough not to join in in an adolescent way, but responsible enough to take responsibility for your child if indeed they're wrong? And we have to teach that morality uh, to our children, and government can't do that. Um, it's important that our religious institutions play a part because that moral center, whether you're Jewish, Muslim, or Christian, has to be there. You have to have some morality given to those kids. And that, uh, the other piece is that there are a lot of single parent heads of household, predominantly female, that you, I, have to pick up the slack for. So sometimes it doesn't come from dad, it comes from the coach. Sometimes it doesn't come from mom, but it comes from the teacher. But it takes a village to raise a child. Because I can do and you can do the best parenting in the world. But your daughter, my daughter, my granddaughters have to marry someone. They have to travel through these streets. So we have to change the paradigm, if you would, take responsibility where we must, and then hold people accountable when they proliferate firearms in our community. And we, we need to let them know, um, and like we did in council, that we're willing to question your pockets. So we're willing to divest like we did in South Africa when it came to apartheid, that companies that invest in firearm, uh, companies that produce uh, assault weapons, that we're willing to take your money, our money, out of your investment portfolio. Because that's how serious it is. Mayors for gun safety have said that they want to use some of that leverage that they've had in a different way. And much of what you're talking about, being able to say, you know what, we have a police force. We have to make sure that they are equipped with weapons. We're not going to buy our weapons from you if you continue to block our efforts to create gun safety legislation in our own cities. Uh, have you gotten feedback on that from those entities? I, I'm wondering if there's no, been they, pushback. They, I don't think they take us seriously yet. Mm. When, when our portfolio managers have given them advance warning, I think there's a six month uh, to a year uh, warning period. And then when we start dis divesting, I think they'll take us seriously. It is only when you impact their bottom line that they pay attention to what, what they view is collateral damage um, by selling a weapon in our community. When you talk about what's been going on in the city of Philadelphia, public safety-wise, and involving the police, uh, recently there have been a couple of cases, uh, one where a gentleman was found not guilty of assaulting the police while taking an assault himself, uh, and then another gentleman who was found not guilty of assaulting a woman at a Puerto Rican Day Parade. Um, there's been a lot of outcry from the public uh, to be able to address these kind of issues. Is there any momentum towards having a police advisory, a public police advisory board, and that kind of thing through public safety? Yes. We introduced legislation um, to call for a permanent police advisory board, an independent police advisory board. And we thank Michael Nutter for the executive order, which established the original um, police advisory board. But that is only an executive order. In an executive order, that means that lasts as long as the mayor lasts. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, he's in his last several years of his administration. So the next mayor may choose not to have one. Um, but we feel as though that it is a ballot referendum um, that we need to have to make it permanent. And not only permanent, but with teeth. The uh, problem here is that um, if you don't want something to work, you're underfunded. So if you have hundreds of allegations, yet two investigators, and the average turnaround time is two years. Um, what you're doing is starving the process so that it doesn't work. Now, I don't just mean for the um, uh, accused, uh, such as Mr. Sabor, uh, you're talking about, who was found innocent, who was beaten in my district, um, but also for the police officers that often are accused wrongly. So a process, a cloud stays over their head for two years, just like it stayed over Mr. Shapur's head for two years. So the people um, that are in blue, I've gone, I've gone to too many police officers' funerals. Too many. So they deserve public safety, just like Mr. Shapur, a taxpayer, deserves public safety. So we need to create um, trusted uh, processes that can um, keep us balanced. 
so that no one runs away with justice. And, and, and when I say that, if, if people don't have confidence in a complaint system, then we start to lose the middle. And what do I mean by that? That you create a Robin Hood in reverse, where they're rooting for the bad guys, not for the guys in blue that are supposed to protect us, because then they're viewed as an occupying force as opposed to um, our sworn protectors. Councilman, one of the things that you mentioned uh, was taking on violence in the city uh, in multiple levels. And one of the ways of doing it is once you deal with kind of the criminal aspect of it is the prevention piece and making sure that our youth aren't in situations where they feel like they have to commit crimes or use weapons. So talk about some of the efforts that are out there to try to keep kids from getting into the criminal justice system in the first place. Well, what often happens is a kid winds up in a vicious cycle of suspension, not attending school, not getting a good education. Um, some of the scariest things I've heard are designers, architects, and engineers say to me that if an urban kid cannot read up to grade level by the fourth grade, that they know how many prison cells will be necessary by the time they turn 18. So we're, if you know that, then you can reverse engineer the solution to that. Let's get better education in preschool. Uh, and, and by the fourth grade, they should be able to read up to level. So youth courts is a concept that we're engaging instead of suspension, that you have a peer mediation group where you have a youth judge, a youth jury, a youth prosecutor to come in and hear about a suspension. It was out in Chester where they implemented that and they, the judge came in all rise and I you know, started talking about the court uh, in a serious way and he made me sit up straight. I turned off my cell phone and the young people all in the room took it seriously and took responsibility for their actions. So a captain of a, f a basketball team had an outburst in the back of a classroom because the teacher didn't have control of the class, so he told his friends, shut up. And when she turned around, all she saw was him. So when she began to put him out the room, he acted out, banged the desk, and she suspended him. Now that meant he wasn't going to be able to play basketball. He was going to be embarrassed uh, to his parents. And they gave him the option of peer mediation or youth courts. He came in contrite. He had a representative represent him. The jury deliberated. They asked him strategic questions like, is the classroom often out of control? Yes. Did you ever try to confront the teacher about the problem? No. What would you do differently? And he talked about it. And they made him go out the room. His sentence was to write and read a essay in front of the class, which for us is a little embarrassing at times. But it, would, it prevented him from being suspended. It gave empowerment to the young people. And it gave him an opportunity to have a second chance. And not a bad record in his file. The beauty of that model is you, one day you're to defend it, next week you're trained to be a jurist, and someday even a judge. And so it teaches citizenship and self-responsibility. Janie Blackwell has been a shero uh, in the area of um, taking responsibility for things like day reporting centers, alternatives to incarceration. It cost us $130 two dollars a day to incarcerate someone on state road when ideally for people who are nonviolent, non-sexual offenders two years or less we could have them with an ankle bracelet for twelve dollars a night uh, no a month and then have them day report to deal with community service whether it's cleaning a lot of cleaning graffiti and at twelve o'clock have them deal on their personal issues, whether it's drug addiction, whether it's um, anti-violence measures and workshops, uh, whether it's continuing their education. But it would be court mandated, all for half of, half of what we spend every day to put them into um, human kennels, uh, for lack of a better word. So we need to do some things differently. Um, our former uh, police commissioner said, we can't arrest our way out of our problem. We have to change mindsets. We have to change paradigms. And we have to do some things differently. Some guys and women need to learn back to how to do things with their hands. So a plumber, an electrician, a painter, a carpenter, these things were taken out of public school, shop. We need to put them back. And not necessarily to the degree that you are a licensed plumber. But if you can change a $12 wax ring off of a toilet, you can, in my community, make a living honestly. And a lot of these kids, if you give them that alternative to be able to have the dignity of work, won't choose the gun. And so we need to give them that right hand of fellowship or left hand of punishment choice. 
How important are unions to making sure that young people have access to trades and trade career opportunities once they get those skills? Um, I think that union activity is important. Um, I think that um, my grandfather and, and my father also uh, were, were proud union members. I, can't, well, I went to school off of a union scholarship. So when you say important, it is created in America, the middle class, so we should continue to support it. And the other part, uh, dealing with keeping children occupied, keeping the youth occupied so that they're not getting involved in some of these activities, and those fr uh, saying about idle hands, uh, are there efforts to close those gaps between time that school is over to the point in which uh, parents are back home or they're having to go home and take care of other family members? Uh, that three to four hour period in which many children are unsupervised. Well, you, you, you point out an interesting statistic again that that's when the problems happen. Latchkey kids who don't have activities are more inclined to get involved in some mischief that winds up in criminal activity. Um, flash mobs happen because people are bored. I mean, I, I talk to young people, we have a youth commission, and I said, well, what is this phenomena of uh, flash mobs? So, councilman, y'all closed after school programs. Uh, they don't let us in the gym. Uh, and what do you expect us to do? And it was like the obvious that they're right. So, and also in recreation, a basketball often is the bait, is bait. Like you would catch a fish, so you throw the basketball out there, you bring them in and you teach them a lesson about sportsmanship, about citizenship, about scholastics, because you can't play on my team if you aren't getting good grades. So it is the way by which we reach young people, whether it's PAL, or whether it's the recreation department. It, and sometimes, PAL saves lives because if I'm playing basketball with a kid from another neighborhood, and I know him, and I, you know, I, I interact with him, and then I see him later that night, I'm less inclined to want to attack him, victimize him, or let my friends do it. No, that's Johnny, he's got a heck of a jump shot, and we're not gonna mess with him. So sports is the great equalizer both in race but in um, neighborhood violence. It's, a, it's the kind of thing that we have taken for granted, but because we've cut it, you see upticks in that kind of youth violence, and idle mind is the devil's workshop. Councilman, a, another factor to public safety um, is that often goes underreported and underrecognized is the impact that the environment has on impoverished communities and how that can roll forward and impact a lot of different areas. You're someone who didn't necessarily see themselves as an environmental uh, hero, but that's where you start starting to find yourself. I've learned that there are different shades of green in, in being a green person or a green city. The first level in the neighborhoods is uh, conservation and energy um, uh, 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 